I visited, first of all, I'd like to thank Emily and Greg uh, for the kind invitation to have me come here and share with you uh, the recent work uh, that we have done in our attempt uh, to manage cancer. So I'll be talking today about cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease uh, and show you evidence that it cannot be what most people think is that it's a genetic disease. And I'll show you the evidence, uh, both um, theoretical and experimental. So the way I like to begin my presentations on this subject is to always show you the report card how we're doing in our attempt uh, to manage cancer. So um, I've been accumulating this information for more than 15 years with the hope that we might be able to see at some point a drop in the number of people dying each year and each day in the United States from cancer. So these are the data from the American Cancer Society. Again, looking at 2013 to 2012, uh, new cases, deaths per year. You get the number of deaths per day by simply dividing deaths per year by 365, and you get an estimate of how many might be dying each day from cancer. Um, you'll notice there is a relentless increase in new cases. The numbers of people dying from cancer uh, it is a, a pretty much similar to the population increase, which is about 5.2% over these same years in the United States. Of course, none of this is really super accurate. It's <coughs> these are just estimates. The problem here, as you can see from looking at these numbers, we're not really making any major progress in dropping the number of people dying each day uh, and each year from cancer. We raise all this money that you hear about um, for billions of dollars from the NIH private foundations. We, we don't seem to get any really big drop, right? Um, I put there the pink ribbon Susan Coleman uh, Foundation. You know, you put pink ribbons, people run, bike, CrossFit, I don't know what they do. Uh, raising money to breast cancer, and the more money we raise for cancer, the more cancer we get. Um, Susan Coleman uh, for breast cancer raises all this money and breast cancer in women has now surpassed heart disease as the number one killer of American women. Thank you, Susan Coleman. Okay, this is another paper that we've mentioned before in some of the, the work from this group. Uh, the, the Food and Drug Administration has approved 92 drugs from 2000 to 2016 and um, as you can see, they've had only a marginal benefit in overall survival, which is ultimately what is the key. The key to knowing whether something works is whether or not it keeps you alive longer and quality of life. And what we're seeing here, for all the millions of dollars that we have spent on cancer drugs, we only see about a 2.4 month improvement in overall survival, okay? And it, what we know is from, these, from a number of these drugs, is that you can also get hyperprogressive disease, which is not mentioned, but which means that if you take one of these drugs, there's a, a, a significant probability that you will die from the drug before the cancer kills you. Okay? And we also don't know, in any good statistical way, how many people are dying from the treatments rather than actually from the cancer. That's another piece of evidence that's blurred. We don't really know about that. What is going on? Why no progress? Well, this is what I'm going to talk about. What causes a growth-regulated normal cell to become a growth-dysregulated cancer cell? Dysregulated cell growth is what we call what cancer is. It's, and I'm going to show you evidence, hard evidence, that it's mitochondrial dysfunction or damage that leads to the origin of cancer. And in this little diagram of the cell, uh, you see the mitochondrion, I've pointed out, and the nucleus. These are the two organelles within the cell that we need to focus on to better understand the origin of cancer. Cancer arises from damage to the respiration of the cell. That little bean-shaped organelle, the mitochondria, is responsible for us getting energy so that every one of you looking at me can understand or at least see that I'm here. Because without energy, 
Nothing works. So that little organelle can be damaged from oncogenic viruses, radiation, carcinogens in the environment, hypoxia, chronic inflammation, uh, rare inherited mutations. Whatever it is, there's a whole range of things that can chronically damage the ability of the cell to generate energy. When that damage happens, what's produced are ROS, reactive oxygen species. These are radical oxygen <coughs> forms. They damage DNA, protein, and lipids. So what you see in the nucleus, somatic DNA mutations and most other abnormalities seen in cancer are downstream effects of these ros induced damage to the nucleus. So the question we have to ask ourselves, should we be focusing on downstream phenomena or the actual origin of what caused the downstream problems? That's the key here. So again, we encapsulate our approach to managing or understanding nature by using theories. So the scientific theory is simply an attempt to explain the facts of nature. Reality is replicated uh, is based on replicated facts where the interpretation of the facts is based on credible theories. We can look back in history and we can see how these uh, facts have been interpreted. The heliocentric theory of Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler could better explain the movement of celestial bodies than could the geocentric theory of Aristotle and Ptolemy. The germ theory of Louis Pasteur could explain better the origin of contagious diseases than could the bad air miasma theory of Hippocrates and Galen. The Darwin Wallace theory of evolution by natural selection could better explain the origin of species than could the theory of special creation. What I'd like to introduce to you today is can the mitochondrial metabolic theory explain better the origin and management of cancer than can the somatic mutation theory? We're going to now compare and contrast. I consider the last number four just as important to man's knowledge as the first three because it deals with life and death issues critically. So, what do we consider cancer today? Is a genetic disease. It's a current dogma. The dogma, as I told you, is a very powerful force on the brain. Consider political and religious dogma. We have dogma in science just as well. The gene theory of cancer is a dogma. Cancer is a genetic disease. One, uh, one, Hanahan and Weinberg's paper is the most cited in the scientific liver, literature over 76,000 times. The hallmarks of cancer have been cited. Cancer cells carry the oncogenic and tumor suppressor mutations that define cancer as a genetic disease. No question. Irrefutable truth. It's in all the textbooks, biochemistry, cell biology, you name it, even from high school, through college, through medical school, cancer is a genetic disease. No other explanation. This has indoctrinated now generations of scientists and physicians. Okay, here's again from the National Cancer Institute webpage. First thing, how cancer arises. Cancer is a genetic disease that is caused by changes in genes that control the way our cells uh, grow and divide. So again, we're solidifying the data. How do we do this? Somatic mutation theory. Mutations in genes that inhibit or stimulate cell division contribute to cancer. The definition of cancer is cell division out of control. That is the definition <coughs> of cancer. We have two competing theories to explain this. One is the somatic mutation theory, and I will be describing the mitochondrial metabolic theory, and I'll leave it up to you folks to see what you think might be the right answer on this. So we have, a, we have pro mutations in tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes that lead to cell division out of control. We further say that somatic mutations, accumulation of random, remember random, somatic mutations cause the development of a cancer cell. So you see the normal cell on the left here, and eventually some, one this mutation, that, whatever it is, you eventually get a malignant cell growing out of control. And here's a, here's a quote from Dr. Vogelstein of the Johns Hopkins uh, University. We now know precisely what causes cancer. A sequential series of alterations, well-defined driver, 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 driver genes. We have a lot of passenger genes, and then we have these driver genes. Remember, this is the, so not all mutations are equally bad, but the drivers are considered the ones that cause dysregulated cell growth. And as a result of all this, we get personalized therapy. So where, where the somatic mutation theory has morphed 
It's morphed into personalized therapy, <coughs> precision medicine. You hear these terms, pre precision medicine. We know your cancer. We have just a thing for you, blah, blah. You're on TV and all this stuff. So the woman is looking into the screen, looking uh, to see if these breast cancer cells have extra copies of a particular gene. Maybe it, what they think, maybe it has some prognostic or therapeutic value, we don't know. The problem is when you take that tissue to get that information that that woman is looking at, it, you run the risk of inflammatory oncotaxis. When you stab a tumor or a piece of tissue, you change the microenvironment in that tumor. So what you're looking at on that screen may no longer be relevant to what's going on in the tissue that you took the information from. Besides, the information that she is looking at is largely irrelevant. I don't expect you to see this. <laughs> but there's two things I want you to see. Hand cancer and else. Okay, why I put this on here is because the conflict of interest statement is three times longer than the abstract of the paper. <laughs> What is going on with that? That's all. A lot of conflict of interest. So the current dilemma is how can we advance new therapies for cancer management and prevention if the 800-pound gorilla thinks that cancer is a genetic disease? He says dogma rules. Who's controlling the dogma? National Cancer Institute and the American and Pharmaceutical Cancer Industries. You're talking about a bigger than an 800 pound gorilla. Okay, so what happens when you challenge the dogma? I don't, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to hear about it. It upsets me. It makes me uncomfortable. And that's, so, so the bottom line, ignore it. That's what we do, we ignore it. Now let me run by you some evidence that I've collected over the years that challenges the somatic mutation theory of cancer. Theodore Bovary, Bovary published an article in 1914 where he outlined his speculative idea that cancer may have something to do with abnormal chromosomes. But he made it very clear. He said, I know nothing about cancer. I'm an interloper. I'm just speculating. And probably everything that I'm telling People in that essay is probably wrong. Nevertheless, he's the father of the somatic mutation theory. He knew nothing about cancer. Now we have new evidence from genomic sequencing. We're not finding mutations in some cancer cells. This is very unusual, right? The way we talk somatic mutation. But we have some cancer cells that can't find any mutations. And now the latest information is coming out. Cancer driver genes found in normal cells. What the hell does that mean? I just told you, driver genes are driving the dysregulated cell growth. So now we're taking tissue from young people and older people. Look at all the driver genes, and people never get cancer. How can you explain driver genes that don't form cancer? How can you explain cancer cells with no mutations? What do we do with evidence that doesn't fit the theory? Ignore it. <laughs> Some carcinogens don't cause mutations, like asbestos. Doesn't cause mutations, but everybody knows asbestos causes cancer. Okay, we have our closest biological relative, the chimpanzee, similar to us, in 98% protein and gene sequence. There's never been a documented case of breast cancer in a female chimpanzee. Okay, uh, what's going on with that? Breast cancer is now overtaking heart disease and killing American women. The chimpanzee never gets cancer. What's going on? He's not. He's actually living in the same diet and lifestyle he did when he first evolved as a species. Also, aboriginal tribes that we uncover, rarely do they have cancer. So they're living in diet and lifestyle issues that they, they had as their past. We, have, we know we can get metastatic cancer without um, mutations. And the nuclear mitochondrial transfer experiments put a nail in this coffin. And I'll talk about that in a minute as soon as I have a chance to move this. Okay, I wrote this paper in 2015 for <coughs> my chapter uh, 11 in my book. Um, cancer is a, a mitochondrial metabolic disease. All I did was go back in the literature and reevaluate the data from all of these top quality bio developmental biologists, the best in the world developmental biologists. They were collecting, they were asking a question, can the nucleus of the tumor cell direct normal development? And it can up to a point. None of them were asking the question, do these data that I'm collecting 
influence whether we consider cancer a genetic nuclear mutation disease or a mitochondrial metabolic disease because they were all indoctrinated by the dogma. They didn't think about an alternative. So this is one of the most beautiful series of experiments because the experiments were done in an unbiased way. They weren't testing what I'm talking about. They were just asking whether a nucleus could, develop, could, could direct normal development. And it could, as I said, up to a point. And then it, the organism would implode because of the genetic mutations in there. So I, if I don't have the time to go through all of the beautiful experiments to support what I'm saying, summarize this. This has been all over the web now by a lot of people. Um, and, I've, and I've put it So you can see green cells beget green cells. Normal cells give rise to more normal cells. And they are growth uh, regulated. So green, they have normal genomes. They have normal mitochondria give rise to regulated growth. The tumor cells beget more tumor cells that are dysregulated. We all know that there are mostly mutations in the nucleus, but the mitochondria are also defective. So uh, is it the mutations in the nucleus, or is it the uh, mitochondrial problems in the cytoplasm that's leading to dysregulated cell growth? So this has been addressed beautifully. So you take the nucleus from the tumor cell, put it in a new cytoplasm with normal mitochondria, and lo and behold, you get growth regulation, despite the continued presence of the mutations in the nucleus. On the other hand, if you take the nucleus from a normal cell and put it in the cytoplasm of a tumor cell, you either get dead cells or, or cells that are dysregulated in their growth cancer cells. This has been done over and over again. Also, mitochondrial transfer experiments. Take normal mitochondria, put it in a tumor, you get growth regulation. These data say that it's not the nucleus, not the mutations that are causing the cancer. It's the, it's the defects in the mitochondria that are causing the cancer. You have to put these experiments together with all the other stuff that I just told you about. And, and anybody with any functional brain cells can see that it can't be a nuclear genetic disease. So if somatic mutations are not the origin, how do we get cancer? Where do they come from? Otto Warburg, the famous German scientist from the last century, said a long time ago, almost 100 years ago, cancer arises from chronic da damage in cellular respiration. Brain <coughs> energy. Take a deep breath. Okay, oxygen comes in, and I'm able to speak, and I'm able to think, uh, you know, as much as I can, uh, energy. But however, what happens in the cancer cell is they replace energy through oxygen with energy through fermentation. Energy through fermentation is, is without oxygen. Cancer cells don't need oxygen, okay? If you have a tumor in the body and you drink cyanide, you're dead, but the tumor is still alive. These experiments have been done by Warburg and others. They don't need oxygen. Why? Because their, their, their cells have shifted from <coughs> oxidative phosphorylation to substrate level phosphorylation, which is a fermentation mechanism that goes back to the earliest days of life on our planet, 2.5 billion years before oxygen came into the atmosphere. <coughs> Cancer cells are simply falling back on ancient fermentation pathways. Now, of course, there was a lot of brouhaha about Warburg and all what he did, but there was, a con there was con confusion because we at Boston College have identified glutamine as the second major fermentable fuel. Everybody knows in the cancer field, glutamine is a powerful driver of cancer, but they didn't know the mechanism. They assumed it was respired. No, glutamine is fermented. This fills the missing link in Warburg's central theory that cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. Now, what we do know is that when you look at a tumor, every cell in that tumor has a different constellation of genetic mutations, but every cell in that tumor is a fermenter, okay? They're all fermenting, regardless of what their genetic profiles are. If we know that, we know how to kill them. Because there's only two fuels that the tumor cell can use to ferment, and it's the sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine. Okay, what's the evidence of what I just told you, right? If you look at the normal mitochondria, beautiful stripes, electron micrograph. Look at those stripes, huh? They're loaded with the proteins and the lipids that drive oxidative phosphorylation so we can get energy from the oxygen that we take in. Here's a little, it tells you what the whole thing is here. Look at, they have no cristae in there. Structure determines function. How is it possible for this mitochondria missing the key elements necessary for oxphos? It won't be able to get oxphos because the cristae, the structures are not there. Okay, structure determines function. Look at, here's for breast cancer. Normal breast cell, beautiful stripes, cristate breast tumor. Look at the vacuoles disrupt, disrupted cristate. And look at this colorectal cancer. All these, these are vacuoles, mitochondria that have no cristate. Structure determines function. It's an evolutionary conserved process in, in general biology. Structure determines function. You see this. Now what I did 
is I went through all the major cancers. And I looked at what's killing about 85% to 95% of people are dying from these groups of cancers. And all of them have structural the abnormalities in the mitochondria. The abnormalities in the number, structure, and function of the mitochondria. Meaning that none of these cancers are going to be able to generate energy through breathing oxfox. It's going to be fermenting. You're going to have to ferment because the structures needed for oxfox are defective. And we can summarize it with this diagram right here, which is, which is very <coughs> clear. Here's a normal mitochondria with stripes. Most of our energy comes from oxidative phosphorylation. Very ink, we get a little bit from these substrate level phosphorylation. But during the formation of a dysregulated tumor, oxfos is replaced by substrate level phosphorylation. I have all the, the pathways, I just didn't want to bore you with all the incredible evidence to support going from. And look at, here's the mitochondria of the tumor cell missing crustate. You get a, a very close relationship between fermentation and malignancy. The more, the more fermentation, the more malignancy. The more fermentation, the more malignancy. And they end up with very little oxfos, if any. So these guys are raging fermenters. Cancer cells are raging fermenters. They don't need oxygen to, 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 for this, this. The other thing, too, is the mitochondria control the cell cycle. The mitochondria determine whether the cell should be quiescent or whether the cell should grow in a normal way. When that organelle becomes defective, these cells grow out of control. As long as they have fermentable fuels in the microenvironment to drive their proliferation, it's very hard to stop them. So if most, if most cancer cells obtain energy through fermentation, then what therapies might be effective for managing and preventing tumors? One approach is reduce the fuel. Reduce the fuel and replace it with non-fermentable fuels. Okay? Not that complicated. So here's an example of what we do. Okay, so we use diet therapies and lower blood sugar with res calorie restriction, water-only fasting, restricted ketogenic diets, they will lower blood sugar and as a conserved uh, evolutionary con conservation when you stop eating, you start mobilizing ketone bodies, the fats, ad adipocytes, and you raise these cancer cells can't use ketone bodies. They don't have, you need a good mitochondria to burn ketone bodies and fatty acids. Tumor cells don't have that. So you lower the blood sugar, elevate the ketones, and the cancer cells now start to uh, drop out. They grow very slow. We built, we published the glucose ketone index calculator to allow cancer patients to know what they need to do to get into the zone where they put pressure on the survival of the tumor cells. So if you have, if you have numbers of 2.0 or below, you're starting to put tremendous pressure on the availability of those cells to use the, one of their two key fuels, which is sugar, glucose. So you lower the cancer cell needs glucose, can't grow very well without it. You gotta lower the glucose and then force feed the ketone bodies, which you can't use. We built this, the outline of, a, of our new strategy for managing cancer. This is called the press pulse therapy. Uh, what we do um, in this case, the cancer patient comes in, uh, he has cancer, diabetes, has all kinds of other things. We immediately look at the blood work, uh, look at the blood work, bring that patient as best we can back into metabolic homeostasis using uh, a variety of different low glucose lowering diets. Things. Okay. We also manage stress, stress management. People are freaked out with cancer. Their blood sugar goes up. They get all depressed and everything. You got to manage that to keep the sugars down. Then once the patient starts to get into the zone, we then hit them with very low doses of non-toxic drugs that further put pressure on glucose and glutamine. The only two fuels driving the beast. We use hyperbaric oxygen. And hyperbaric oxygen can replace radiation by increasing ROS and tumor cells. So we move the patient from a state of sickness to a state of management, okay? In that managed state, now we have a chance because the tumors are growing slower. We have a chance to strategize how we can, how we can get rid of them, okay? And eventually, we either maintain long-term management with a good quality of life or even possible resolution, which I'll show you evidence for. And, the, and here's the situation. To improve this, to make it work for the majority of people, it's basically dosage, timing, and scheduling of these different combos to, to work this out for the best. This is not sexy science. NIH doesn't fund this stuff. It's not sexy, but it keeps people alive. And I don't consider anything wrong with that. Now here's a direct example of, I have this paper now under review, for publication, um, 
This dog was a pit bull. Uh, it was it, it, at seven years old. It had a mast cell tumor, uh, a malignant mast cell. They have all the same kind, very similar kinds of mutations that you see in some human tumors. The dog was eating old roy dog food, developed a mast cell tumor. The pet parent said, oh, I'm going to give the dog a vegan diet, raw vegetables. After two years, the tumor exploded to a much bigger uh, uh, tumor. Uh, scratched her head and said, you know, where does this dog come from? It comes from the wolf. What do wolves eat? They eat meat. So um, she, she immediately transitioned the diet away from raw vegetables to uh, chicken with the bone in it or fish oil, raw egg, cut the calories down, uh, did exactly what we've done in the mouse for a long time. And lo and behold, this big ass tumor came a spot, a little black spot. Here's his face. Here's the dog. See him? There he's got the face. Here's his nose. Here's where the tumor used to be. Now, this, um, what's interesting about this, uh, this dog, just a few months, this, this thing uh, disappeared. The dog um, died at 15 years of age, longer than most pit bulls, from heart failure. The tumor never came back, okay? So I, I could go for hours on the mechanisms by which all this happened, but this is the evidence. The evidence is the dog was resolved of his aggressive tumor. And the, and the patient, the, the, uh, the owner of the dog said, I don't want my dog to get chemo and radiation, which is going to cost $10,000 and make the dog sick. The dog did not use chemo and radiation, only a, a raw meat diet. Now let's talk about humans. Okay, this is the tumor that we've been focusing on, glioblastoma, very deadly human cancer. Uh, median survival, which is very important, 10 to 15 months, and I have other things in there that are not quite as important, but they, they are when you, when you have this tumor. Um, now we go to the next one here. Uh, okay, here's an example of what this horrible tumor is. You can see it all discoloration, midline shift, causes uh, intracranial pressure. Intracranial pressure is what kills most of the folks with with glioblastoma. The tumor cells in invade through the entire neural parenchyma. Uh, they go, they use blood vessels as a, a tract system. They go along this, these darker purple cells here, darker purple, are around blood vessels. So the tumors seed the entire cortex. So that's why you can never surgically secure GBM because the tumors are already out there. And what they continue to do, despite all the evidence that I said not to do, they give a vast Avastin is supposed to block blood vessels. Tumors don't care. They move right through. They, they, in fact, the more Avastin you give, the more infiltration you get through the brain. Can you believe this? Yeah, they do that Avastin crazy stuff. Now, this is an interesting thing in relationship to what uh, we heard earlier from Greg and others. The irreproducibility of science, right? Science can't be reproduced? Ah, well, not always. There's nothing more re reproducible than how fast people die when they're treated with the standard of care. <laughs> this is the results of five independent surgical institutions from Canada. And I have the same, same survival curves from our institutions, Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, you got the same thing in Japan, Germany, England, the best of my words. You're going to get a profile that looks like this. Okay, no improvement in a hundred years. Right? Think about that. We, we have the Webb telescope, a million miles from Earth circling, getting us to look for the very origin of our universe. And yet we've made no improvement in glioblastoma in 100 years. What the hell is going on with that? Can you believe it? Okay, I'll tell you what happened. Okay, when somebody is diagnosed with glioblastoma, uh, we cut it out. And then, as soon as the patient recovers from the cutting, the debulking, we then irradiate the guy's brain, which creates massive elevation of blood sugar. And because the brain swells from the radiation, we give the guy high-dose steroids, which also create hyperglycemia. And when we irradiate the brain, we break the, the very sensitive glutamine-glutamate cycle, which is a part of our neurons and glia, freeing up massive amounts of glutamine to feed the beast. And not only that, about 80% of these tumors are laced with human cytomegalovirus, which is like a turbocharger for the tumor cells to use glucose and glutamine. Okay? And this is all documented. I wrote article after article after article describing the molecular mechanisms by what's going on inside this guy's head when you treat him with standard of care. Okay, here it is again. 
Um, over and over again, we get the same results. What did Einstein say? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, is insanity. Why does this not change? How many people have died as the result of this absurdity and continue to die? So to test the hypothesis, if we say that glucose and glutamine are the two fuels that drive the beast, why don't we design an experiment to test the hypothesis that if we simultaneously target the two fuels, we will be able to significantly improve overall survival. So we develop the best animal models of glioblastoma. Well, we do it the animal model first, and then we can go to the human. So we use the drug 60-oxynorleucine, which is a glutamine-targeting drug, and we give the animals a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet to lower the blood sugar. So we lower the blood sugar, bringing down glucose, we elevate ketones to protect the normal cells, so they're neuroprotective, and then we give them pulse of dawn, uh, which targets the glutamine. So I'm not gonna, I have beautiful biochemical hard evidence, but I'm just gonna show you the final result, the test the hypothesis. So the blue line are the animals that ate the high carb diet with no treatment, so they die real quick. You can see how fast they go. Okay, the ketogenic diet by itself did include a, a, a modest level of improvement, but you're not targeting the glutamine with the ketogenic diet. The drug, Don, had also some level of improvement, but you're not targeting the glucose with the Don. When you add the diet with the drug, you get really good survival. And we're pushing this way out now, way out. And we're gonna test it in humans, and we're starting to see very similar kinds of responses, even more spectacular than the mice. Humans are much better to use these metabolic therapies than the mouse. The mouse's basal metabolic rate is seven times faster than that of the human. Okay, they eat 20% of their food a day. Can you believe body weight? 20% of their body weight in food a day. You know, we have so much more flexibility to make this work in humans than in the mouse. So our first attempt was this guy from Egypt, a guy with the glioblastoma, corn farmer. He comes in, my, co my good uh, colleague, I work with uh, uh, El Saka, Dr. El Saka. So he calls me up, he said, we got a patient, let's do this press call on I said, fine. So let, let's, uh, we, we, we gave him some fasting and keto. He had an awake craniotomy to debulk the tumor. We, we kept him on for another three weeks, uh, restricted diets. You know, we weren't really hitting glutamine too hard, but he was doing good. We kept pushing off the radiation. So he says, El Saka calls me up and he says, we got to irradiate him now. I said, why? He said, oh, we have to do it. Standard care says you must irradiate everybody. I don't give a damn, is it? In the United States, or Egypt, wherever it is, we got to irradiate every cancer patient, brain cancer. So he took all the radiation and the temozole. He did pretty good. Went back out, started working the field. We published the paper, we're all excited. So El Saka calls me up and he says he's got headaches now at, at, at 29 months uh, following diagnosis, and he dies at 30 months. So they did a, an autopsy on his brain, and what they found, he died from radionecrosis brain liquefaction. So provocative question, should the ketogenic metabolic therapy uh, uh, replace the standard of care. In my opinion, we're not going to move the needle on these GBN patients until we abandon the radiation in the brain. Why is that so hard to understand? So we use examples. Brittany, okay, a beautiful young lady here, diagnosed with low grade, low grade tumor in early January of 2014. Within two weeks, it exploded into a glioblastoma. Inflammatory oncotaxis. So here's her with her husband. Um, she starts the standard of care. I want you to look carefully. Here she is here before the treatment. Here she is after or, or while she's being treated. You see the puffy face? That's called moon face from elevated levels of steroids. You give the steroids, you get a consequence. A moon face indicates that her blood sugars are very, very high. Well, she knows the outcome. She decides to take her own life. Death with dignity, big article in People magazine. I'm going to kill myself rather than go through the standard of care. Okay? That's pretty bad when your patients would kill themselves rather than take your treatment. <laughs> but that's what happened. Now this little guy is Danny Sheen. Uh, Danny was diagnosed with pineal, which is a childhood glioblastoma, in 2017. And Danny passed away in 2021. But look at Danny's face. You see how puffy it is? Here he is with his uh, favorite toy. He died a week after this picture. Um, this is a tragedy. 
This should not happen. We, we are working now uh, with support from the British Childhood Cancer Fund to, uh, we have a, a diet drug therapy that will allow these kids to live a far longer high quality of life. We collected the data now. And it's going to be a crime if they don't use that. And here's Pablo Kelly uh, from Devon, England. He was diagnosed the same time as Brittany. Uh, he wanted no radiation, no, no chemo. They were, well, you're going to be dead, Pablo, in nine months. He has a story. You can read it in all these British newspapers and things. He doesn't want any of that. He says, I'm going to take my risk. So he goes on metabolic therapy. And um, three years, he's still alive in three years, but his tumor is there. It's not gone. It's still growing, but it's very much more indolent than it was. So he gets it to bulk in 2017. Uh, he thought he was out of it. He goes back eating a few more carbs. Uh, all of a sudden, we see the images on the MRI go up. Oh, it's Pablo. Boom. He goes right back. And I have five years of daily glucose ketone monitoring from Pablo. It's published in the paper. You can read it in this paper. You see all the data that we have. And back down comes the tumor. Managed. So he's had another debulking. But in the time from diagnosis, he's over eight, eight and a half years out now. He's had got married and he's had two kids and he's still getting on with his life. We didn't cure Pablo, but Pablo is living a hell of a lot longer than he would have if he did standard of care. I don't know if there's any what's wrong with that. And you're giving him more kinds of news. They're making it mean sound that like I'm the bad guy. Now, when you say, well, what about other cancers? Well, we published this paper on a guy with uh, lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, very deadly. Went to the guy's liver and brain. My colleague, even Athos, even Julio from Greece, he's got this guy out nine years. He should have been dead a long time ago. Uh, here's one from uh, triple negative breast cancer. Uh, this woman was given, uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, she was given one month to live. She took all kinds of radiation and chemo. They said, there, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing more we can do. Like they always say. So she goes to our, our my colleague's clinic in Istanbul. They give her, she almost died in the emergency from the travel from Cleveland to Istanbul, almost killed her. She he had to be re re resuscitated in the emergency room for two weeks. Finally, she gets you know, out and they do a uh, modified chemo ketogenic diet. And uh, last year, we got pictures of her with her husband in Hawaii, loving life. Anecdotal, right? It's a fluke. It's a fluke. It's a fluke. N of one, right? N of one. You put parachute on a guy. Hundred guys jump out without the parachute. One guy has the parachute. N of one. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do a double blind crossover to make sure it's real. <laughs> and then I wrote this thing on prostate cancer. So uh, that why are we using all the chemical castration and all this crazy shit? I mean, you can you can get really good uh, uh, evidence with uh, metabolic therapy. This is in nature. Right? Everybody likes to ignore everything. So, uh, um, so what we have here is GBM and other stage four, what we call terminal cancer, should not be considered terminal if treated with ketogenic metabolic therapy. Standard of care is the dark side. Pablo Kelly is the bright side. So we published this paper. Can the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer explain better the origin and management than can the somatic mutation theory? So I, I, I kind of was very provocative in showing that the geocentric theory that uh, was str people struggled with for a long time, and look at all the, uh, all the crazy elliptical things that they try to put together when the Earth was the center of the, uh, of the solar system. When you put the sun in the center, everything makes sense, right? So you put the mitochondria in the center of the cancer problem, and everything's going to make sense. We won't be lost with all the immunotherapies, Petruda, Optivo, CAR-T immunotherapies, or all this kind of stuff. I don't know anybody who's died from ketogenic metabolic therapy. Most cancers, including glioblastoma, is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. Cancer is not a genetic disease. Get over it. It's a reliance on substrate level phosphorylation, and I have all, and if you read my papers, I have all the hard evidence to support that. The simultaneous restriction of glucose and glutamine while under nutritional ketosis can help manage most, if not all, cancers. 
The press pulse metabolic therapy is a non-toxic, cost-effective strategy for the possible management of most cancers, especially glioblastoma and some of these, these other cancers that are really bad. And we're starting a global society for metabolic therapy. I've got folks, really good physicians and scientists in numbers of countries that all want to get on board and say, how do I do this? What am I going to do? There's also a documentary film coming out from the stuff that we developed at DC showing how many people are surviving. It's not just a few flukes that I've shown you. Uh, Maggie and Brad Jones are collecting dozens and dozens of people that should have been dead and they're alive and they're appreciative of their life. And then, well, how do we get money to do what I do? Well, I get mostly from foundations and philanthropy, okay? Travis Foundation of Metabolic Cancer Therapies, George Yu, Joe Maroon, Edward Miller, uh, the Kenneth Raynan Foundation, Greg, Greg was so kind in the, with the CrossFit organization, Children with Cancer United Kingdom, the Corkin Family Foundation, Bob Kaplan, my own university, uh, the Oral Academy, and thank you very much for your attention.